speaker. Um, Hussan is a researcher, writer, and campaigner based in Toronto. He organizes as part of and alongside migrant and undocumented communities. Hassan is the coordinator of the Migrant Workers Alliance for Change, Canada's largest migrant workers coalition. Uh, with his co-organizers, he has successfully campaigned to declare Toronto a sanctuary city, to win labor protections in Ontario for migrant workers, and is a co-creator with Aliyah Pabani of Remember January 29 to honor the memory of the Quebec mosque shooting and to fight against Islamophobia. So welcome. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, good evening, thank you so much for having me. Um, hopefully the mics will work a little <laughs> bit, okay. Um, all right, so um, can we go to the next slide please? Thank you. So a few weeks ago I wrote an article about making Ontario a sanctuary province. Um, as you heard, we've been working on this in and out. Yeah, okay. So as, you, as you heard, we've been working on making sanctuary city policies happen across the uh, country, and now we're in this process of moving this towards the uh, provincial process, right? And so bringing people together. So I wrote this article um, in which I made kind of a very simple um, argument that all services should be accessible to everyone, regardless of status. Um, this is something we've been fighting for many years, and the NDP has actually put it in their platform. I was also, you know, in a lot of newspapers talking about and of course, uh, the hate mail started. Um, there was vitriol, there was racism. Next slide, please. Um, now, hate mail is um, nothing new for me. Um, this is something that, you know, a common place for those of us working in migrant and undocumented communities. Uh, in fact, I researched very hard to find things that were not too jarring, because this is an official city event. Um, I'm not gonna read what's on the board, you can see it. So, um, but as I read the comments and as I looked at what people were saying, I realized that there is these, all of these misconceptions, these dominant um, myths that we are, um, where we are constantly hearing and talking about, uh, that, are, uh, that have been shared so much that people have begun to believe them about migration and immigration, right? Uh, we, have begun, we have been collectively miseducated. We've been collectively misled and confused about what the system of immigration in this country is. Hello, yeah, okay. This is great, thank you so much. So we've been collectively misled and confused about what the state of migration is. And I think if we're gonna be talking about sanctuary city, if we're gonna be talking about undocumented people, we have to understand why do people move in the first place? How is it that people become undocumented? So I'm gonna walk us through some of those misconceptions and myths and try and arm you with arguments that you can take home and take to your families and take to your coworkers um, to, to really deal with these questions. Um, next slide, please. Now, what I'm talking about is unity. Right, and I'm not talk I'm talking about unity and the fact that many of the people who are making some of the most egregious and violent comments are also people who are in fact being impacted, being um, uh, by our economic system. These are also people who are struggling. And so when we fight each other at the bottom of the barrel, um, those at the top can get away with a lot. And that's what it means to keep one large segment of your society as second class, third class, fourth class citizens easily exploitable, right? And so, what, what it is that we want to look at is how is it that we've, um, you know, how can, we, how can we get through this conversation? So um, I'm just going to go through some of these comments and these myths that, uh, um, so next slide, please. So the first misconception that we often hear, and the first and the second are very closely connected. I don't know if you can read some of that, but the top one is a headline which says, Canada is the fourth most welcoming country for refugees. This is something you've probably heard a lot. Many of you have heard Canada is this refugee welcoming country, and it's not true, and I'm gonna show you how. Uh, and then the other portion of it is that Canada is full, immigrants are coming here to take our advantage. This is a comment from 19th May from that article, uh, and it's like, you know, stop the insanity, kick out the criminals, they're sneaking into our country as we speak. This is something that many people have been led to believe that these are the facts. Um, so what does it actually mean? Uh, next slide, please. So if you look at, um, if you look at the, um, 
if you look at the state of the world right now, there is a person that is pushed out of their home by environmental catastrophe every second. Do you, you know, every second someone is forced to leave their home and that means they have to uh, migrate somewhere to safety. Now, 75% of the world's mining companies are headquartered in Canada. And these mining companies, so many of these mining companies have been found guilty over and over again of forced displacement, of using gender violence, of stealing land and property from communities, forcing them to move, right? Not just that, um, you know, the Alberta oil sands is now the um, largest producer of uh, greenhouse gas and connected emissions in North America, right? Which means that tomorrow when there's a, um, Typhoon in the Philippines, which is forcing people out of their homes, the direct, it is happened because Canada profited from it, right? So we have to understand that people are immigrating and being forced to leave their homes, and they're coming here, um, but they're being pushed out of their homes in the first place um, by things that we profit from. Next slide, please. Now, another thing we have to remember is, you know, we often have this myth of Canada as this a peacekeeping nation. As you can see, Canada is the world's fifth largest exporter of military uh, uh, armaments and, and weapons. Um, and what does that mean? It means that every time someone is shot to death um, somewhere, someone profits in Canada, right? Between 2002 and 2013, there were 520 Muslims who were killed just in three countries, um, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and uh, Iraq every day. 520 people every day for 11 straight years, right? And so when your families are dying and you choose to immigrate and then you arrive then you come to this place called Canada and you're looking for um, some basic dignity, then we have to remember what it is that we're doing with those people. And of course we know that many of these wars are happening um, um, and are directly impacting Muslims, they're impacting black communities and black Muslims, it's women and children who are impacted. And so, um, that, that's the reality of what happens before we start talking about, oh, all of these people are choosing to come here and take our resources. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, now, here's another thing that we really need to think about. So, as you can see from the slide at the top, um, right now, Canada, as you can see, these are the list of the 10 countries which host over half of the world's refugees. Um, I'll just read them out to you. Jordan, Turkey, Pakistan, Lebanon, Iran, Ethiopia, Kenya, Uganda, the DRC, and Chad. None of those countries are in North America or Europe. North America or Europe don't take refugees, okay? That's not what happens. They profit from, we profit from that displacement. The other diagram, I just did these numbers. Um, it's gonna be hard for you to note, but that is the total number of immigrants that or migrants that entered Canada in 2016. The red portion is the people who entered permanently. All of the other portions are temporary foreign workers, asylum seekers, international mobility program workers, study permit holders who entered here temporarily, okay? So what that means is that people come to the country temporarily, work here, and at one point are either forced to leave or will become undocumented. And Canada has a system of temporary immigration. It's not a system of permanent immigration. And so to show you just a very quick example, I'm gonna see how, how you will do in the current permanent res residence test. So can I ask everyone to stand up, please? Okay. Now, if you are under the age of 18 or over the age of 36, please sit down. Now, if you do not have a two-year degree um, of education, please sit down. Minimum two years or above, okay? If you do not have permanent full-time employment, so contract, temporary, part-time, et cetera, please sit down. Of this room, one, two, three, four, five, six people are people who would actually be able to get some few, may have a slight chance of getting permanent residency. Please sit down, thank you. In this entire room, if you were to apply tomorrow, that's the system, okay? May, the rest of you could come here, you could come here temporarily, you could work in the fields, you could take care of people's homes, children's homes, but you're not actually gonna be able to live here permanently. And if you have to return to a place of war or climate catastrophe, you're gonna have to choose to live here without papers. And then you were going to live in daily fear of detentions and deportations. Okay, next slide, please. 
So we have this notion that Canada has this fair and rational immigration system. You hear this all the time. There is a queue, there's a process, there are queue jumpers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, so, you know, in the next comments, like, we have borders, we have rules. Without borders, we're not a country. Uh, they have to get in line and await their turn to enter the immigration process. Because we've been led to believe that there's very, this, like, very rational system, and you saw how that works. Now, in case you don't know, the permanent resident system is a lottery, okay? These are the lottery numbers from January 2018. So every four months, there's a draw, and people are picked from it, okay? I'm not making this up, just look it up, right? Like, it's, there, is not, there is no queue, right? It's a lottery, people are moved to the top, and then they're picked from there. So that's this immigration system. Of course, people are gonna become undocumented, right? Now, in addition, next slide, please, I mean, well, we have to remember that these are indigenous territories. And so how can you have a rational, pragmatic, practical system which is premised on the first wave of movement being actually theft of land? Mo Canada did not get immigration papers. Now it wants the rest of us to get it, right? And particularly in Ajax here where we're living under the Williams Treaty, which is a treaty that was about enforcing um, um, you know, land dispossession, was enforced surrender from indigenous people to be able to like, steal their um, lands. We have to ask ourselves, what is this like, rational system that now wants to be enforced, okay? Um, next slide, please. Now, another misconception, this is something that was also just uh, touched on um, by Graham, is undocumented immigrants are criminals, right? This is something you hear all the time about. What is really scary about advocates and MWAC is they care nothing about the truth and will lie about anything to bo bring more criminals into Canada. I get this every day. Um, so let's be very, very clear. Um, according to the CBSA, of all the people that detained in 2016, 94.2% um, were not, had no attachment with criminality, according to them. I would say the numbers are higher, right? Um, not just that, we know that, what does it mean to be associated with criminality? We're just working with a woman who um, is in detention right now and she has criminal charges because she stole bread to feed her family. That's what they mean with those 6%, right? We um, are know that people, because they are forced to live in a cash economy, are selling weed, which is now legal. But unfortunately, people have amassed all of these charges and are spending lifetimes in detention, in case you don't know, Canada has an indefinite detention system. So we have this system where we are, you know, migration and criminality is deeply associated. And, as a, and all of these misconceptions are designed so that we keep fighting each other, right? So poor people, working class people, racialized people, undocumented people, migrants, everybody who is at the bottom of the barrel um, keeps fighting each other. Next slide, please. And so this is, you know, and this is what we really want to talk about, right? Because there's this notion that immigrants are to blame for few jobs, low wages, and inadequate services. Um, so, you know, at the top, there's a comment from 16th May. No way our health care system is swamped. Uh, there are no jobs out there that will sustain new families with a high cost of living here. So let's be real, okay? We are all suffering. But immigrants are not responsible, okay? Now, that image at the top right um, shows the real wages. Um, on the right is the average real wage, and on the left is the average wage of a CEO um, between <clears throat> 1998 and 2008. As you can see, CEO wages increased um, 70%. Um, regular wages went down 10%. We are being impoverished, all of us. It's not that immigrants are stealing jobs, but in fact, the entire economy is moving towards precarious, low-wage work, as you can see from that um, picture there. Um, job growth since 2000, most of it is in precarious and part-time work. We are, um, we are seeing that the ba bosses are making so much more money, while poor and working class people are fighting each other and saying, oh, it's immigrants, it's undocumented people, they're the reason why. Um, and of course, we need to remember, for example, the second, the richest person in Ontario, Galen West, who owned Lob Loblaws, um, and Loblaws is currently alleged um, to have put away $400 million uh, in, tax, in, tax, in, a, in a tax offshore haven. 
right? So those are the people who don't pay taxes. Those are the people who don't really work. Those are the people who steal all of these conditions. And then, you know, on the right, you can see these are the global CO2 worker pay ratios. And as you can see, Canada is number two in the world in terms of differences. So the rate of inequality in Canada is only second to the United States. Compare that to Australia, Britain, Japan, and Norway. That's up there. Um, next slide, please. And so, when we talk about jobs, another sort of myth that really comes around, it's a misconception, is right, undocumented people don't pay taxes. So, you know, Ontarians have worked hard and paid taxes all of their lives. They are, only they are deserving of a funded healthcare system. So, let's be real. Um, let me just give you one example. Seasonal agricultural workers um, in Ontario, and I bring up seasonal agricultural workers because they are the... Um, Thank you for coming, um, because they are the, um, there's a huge population of um, micro agricultural workers here in, in the in Durham region. And just in 2004, they paid $300 million in employment insurance that they did not get back, right? So undocumented people pay all your municipal taxes, pay all your provincial taxes, many people pay income taxes, and they're not getting back. In fact, if tomorrow, if we go back to that slide of all of those people who are temporary, who are excluded from all of these jobs and protections, who, sorry, uh, rights and services and protections, those people have been underwriting the social services system for decades. If tomorrow there was a strike and all the migrant undocumented people were like, we've been paying taxes for decades, we'll stop, the entire social service system would collapse. Right, so the notion of sanctuary city and provincial services, when people are like, well, are they paying taxes? The point is, they've been underwriting, we've been underwriting this for, for a long time. So we're not asking for um, you know, um, our money back, we're just saying we need services going forward. And that's really important to know um, when we're talking about this. Um, next slide, please. Now, another sort of concept is, you know, misconception of the sanctuary cities are a new idea. This is a bad idea. And I just want to remember, um, so first of all, just a very brief history. Sanctuary cities started um, in the 60s and 70s in Mexico when Chilean refugees moved there. Um, and so it's, it's been an idea that came out of the South. It was attempted first in North America in the 80s. But also, what is sanctuary city? What is this notion, right? So if we talk about, you know, when uh, Harriet Tubman brought um, slaves, um, freed slaves, runaway slaves, um, liberated people across that border into Canada, that was creating zones of sanctuary. When Chinese railroad workers in the 1800s um, became undocumented, they were taken in by indigenous communities in those Coast Salish Church in the West Coast near Vancouver and were uh, embedded into those, into those communities, that was sanctuary, right? If tomorrow you have an uncle who gets sick, you have an aunt who needs you know, a little bit of support, we care for each other. That is what it means. That is the kind of world we live in. And so when we start talking about dollars and figures, states, all of these misconceptions, we start treating each other in this dehumanizing way. I often find that the people who make those arguments are also kind and generous people because we're being misled, because we're being misdirected from the real cause and the real issue that we need to face. And so, um, and, and, and what that means is we need to focus on a massive tr transformation, I mean, Mercedes talked about it, Graham talked about it, of our society and our culture and our ideas, and really understand that we are not uh, going to be, we shouldn't be divided on the basis of status, we need to be divided on the basis of the haves and the have-nots. And the have-nots, some of us have status, some of us have don't, some of us are racialized, some of us are white. We're women, we're men, but what is happening is that there's a very small group of people who controls everything and profits from us, first being pushed out of our homes, then being denied services here, forced to work, low paying jobs where we can't even make our ends meet because we're too afraid to speak back against bad bosses. Um, next slide, please. And so, um, what we're looking at here is, you know, we're talking about a future, um, and so obviously we need changes, you know, Graham laid out some of those ideas, Mercedes also about what sanctuary cities can do, you know, those are the same seven things that Mercedes mentioned that Graham's mentioning again, we've been at it for a long time, but we also need changes provincially and federally, um, and provincially that means all services should be accessible to people, federally that means regularization, and it means a total transformation of society. We need to think about what kind of society we live in. Not just what kind of policy we want, but what kind of world we want to create together. What kind of um, interaction we can have us with ourselves to make that possible. Um, and, and, and you know, that is a question of gender justice, it's a question of reproductive rights, it's a question of disability justice, it's a 
question of anti-racism. We have to pull all of these questions together when we're talking about migration because migration is interlinked with every one of those things. Just for example, Canada right now, if you have a family member who is disabled, your entire family will be denied permanent residency status. That's the law, right? So we have to connect the many, many reasons that people lose status. Um, so next slide, please. So what we need to do is, you know, I'm going to invite all of you. We shared some stories, shared some anecdotes. Look this up. Have these arguments at your dinner table. Talk to your uncle. Um, talk to your family members. Talk to your neighbors. We need to change these misconceptions. And at the same time, we need to organize ourselves to hold decision makers to the fire at all levels. Make sure they do the right thing. And if not, show up and make sure that they know they're watching. Um, and then let's envision a just world. Right? Let's talk about human dignity in all its forms. Thank you. Thank you so much. So a question that comes to mind is, uh, you know, you've been working in this field for a long time and you shared uh, these myths are certainly based on comments that you've heard, uh, feedback that you get in all different forms. So, so where have you been surprised for, about support? Where have you found support for Sanctuary City that has surprised you or uh, gives you uh, a sense of wanting to continue? and getting up in the morning and continuing the important work that you're doing. Every day an undocumented woman gets up in the morning and decides to take her child to school while being afraid that she might be detained or deported. To me, that is creating the world we want to live in. Right? Every day a, family, a person walks um, into work knowing that their boss is going to pay them $5 an hour and if they get injured they'll call the police on them first so that they don't have to pay WSIB but continues to do that to feed their family. That's not just repression and oppression. That's human resilience, that despite people being pushed out of borders, despite people being displaced from their homes, we are choosing to live and create dignity and happiness and love and joy and community in the places we live in. That gives me hope. It is when people, everything good that we have here, everything, right, is a result of struggle. And it has never been given to us. It has never been granted. And we've been, and, and it's also a result of colonialism and all of these other things that I talked about. But like, when we talk about human dignity and just basic rights, um, it's struggle. So struggle gives me hope. It gives, we have the possibility, and we are doing it every day, even in these immensely unjust circumstances. Um, and, you know, and I'm sure many people in this room are doing that. So this collective gives me hope. Thank you. Great.